Good morning. How's everybody doing? Ron is back. Uh, we're holding uh, in Paco donations until the next pick up. So go ahead and stockpile stuff at home and then we'll, uh, we'll let you know when we're ready to start that. Uh, we're contemplating if anybody would like to uh, help with a men account men's accountability group. You can speak to me about that, see if there's any interest in doing that. We've tried something like that in the past, but we can try again. Um, Sunday morning, we're studying how to witness to Mormons. Wednesday evening, we're studying the followers of Christ. We're looking at the uh, characteristics, personality traits of the, the apostles. And of course, Awana, we had 30, 30 kids in Awana. Right there. <laughs> Pretty good. Amen. So, we're glad you're here. We know you could go somewhere else, so we're glad you decided to worship with us this morning. And we're going to return to our uh, session, our study on the will of God, how uh, he functions in our lives, and we're, we're looking at elements and characteristics of a ministry, using Paul as our example, of a ministry that is functioning in the will of God. And up to this point, we've looked at precision, Providence, planning, priority, and prosperity. Those are, the, those are principles that mark out someone who's devoted to doing God's will. Those are all positive in nature, but as I alluded to last time that we met, today we're going to begin with another principle or element that is of a negative nature. It's in there, so we're going to look at it. It's the sixth principle. It's in verse 31. So we're going to look at our source scripture. First thing this morning, in Romans 15, verses... Darn, I forgot my joke. I'll have to come next week to hear that one. Uh, uh, Romans 15, 30 through 33. Romans 15, 30 through 33. So take a minute. Clear your minds. Put the world outside. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. Let's just worry about the Word of God, okay? For the next 30, 40 minutes, let's just, let's just major on the most major thing in the universe, all right? So if you're ready for the Word of God, Romans 15, 30 through 33, would you signify that by saying amen? amen. And would you stand with me out of respect for the reading of the Word of God, which is a light unto our feet? Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the, peace of the, now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Okay, you can be seated. So, the next, uh, the sixth principle we want to look at is that when you're in ministry and you function within the will of God, you're going to experience some persecution. Persecution is the next element. Uh, see, in verse 30, Paul's asking for prayer. He's writing to the church in Rome, and he's asking them to pray for him. And the reason for that prayer request is in verse 31. That I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service or my ministry for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Now, I want, what we really want to grasp, what we want to hang on to, is that first line in that first verse. That I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe. All right? That word delivered is a very interesting word. It's the word in the Greek, it's Rome. It's Rome. And what it means, much more than just to be delivered, it means to be rescued from a dangerous, life threatening situation. So, what Paul is saying when he writes to the church in Rome, he's saying, I want you to rescue me, pray for my rescue. 
from a dangerous situation. It's a little bit different than being delivered, all right? A little bit different when you read it in the, in the Greek. So, now it was not uncommon for Paul to face danger. It happened all the time in his ministry. It was a way of life for him, in fact. And he was, he was in danger most of the time. And he continually asked for prayer. If you look at his writings, he continually asked for prayer because of that danger. In 2 Corinthians 1.8, he speaks of almost dying. Later on in the fourth chapter, he speaks about being on the brink of death. And what he means is, when he speaks about that, he's in danger of dying because of the cause of Christ. All right? Because Paul is functioning in the will of the Lord. So in verse 31, in our source text, he's saying that a person that is in the will of God, who is really moving ahead for the glory of God, that they're going to be persecuted because they're invading the kingdom of the enemy. Did you know that? Who's, who's the ruler of the earth? Satan. Satan. Satan is the ruler of the earth. Now, if you're going to profess God's words in somebody else's kingdom, what's going to happen to you? You're going to be persecuted. In fact, uh, Peter would teach us that if we don't have persecution in our life, we need to check our own, our own salvation. Okay? But Paul is, has a group of Jews who are very resentful against him. And even though at this time he doesn't have any idea what they're going to do to him, because they will get after him, but it's predictable to him that they are going to be hostile towards him because they have been hostile in the past. And I want you to understand something about Paul. Paul, Paul was not a soft-spoken, smiling, sweet preacher. Paul was confrontive. Paul could almost be characterized as being combative. He was direct when he spoke, and he spoke the truth of God, and he said what needed to be said without any compromise or any word for compliance. Any, he didn't worry about complying with the, today's moral or that day's moral scruples. And because his confrontive ministry, Paul endured a, a large amount of persecution in his life. And he knew that eventually, when he went back to Jerusalem, with the money that he had gathered from the other churches, he knew that there was going to be a negative reaction to his return by those who hated him in that part of the world. And the Jews in Judea hated Paul because Paul had renounced their belief system. Paul had renounced Judaism. Remember, Paul at one time, he was these people's hero. He was, the, he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was the one that was hunting down Christians. He was, in imprisoning, he was imprisoning Christians. He was persecuting Christ. But now, he's a traitor in a turncoat in their eyes, and he's become one of the dreaded Christians who he once helped persecute. He's abandoned his spiritual heritage, and beyond that, he's proclaiming the lordship of Jesus Christ. He's proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's bringing a new message. He's speaking about a, a new covenant. Can you imagine speaking of a new covenant to a Jew? He's saying the old covenant is passed away. Oh, man, that's all bad news. And the Jews, because of that, are greatly hostile to him. In fact, if you read his letters, there was a group of Jews that followed Paul wherever he went. And as soon as Paul finished preaching in a community... They came in right behind him. And a lot of them were professed Christians. And they, they came in behind him and taught fallacies and heresy. Right behind him. So Paul was confronted with this all the time. And, he, you know, Paul preached about the equality of Jew and Gentile. Not only that, Paul taught about the equality of God and Jesus. Oh, man. For, for, for a Jew, those are all terrible things. So there's this hostility towards them, and he tells them, he writes, uh, pray for me that I might be delivered, that I might be rescued from this dangerous situation. So what I want you to see out of, out of this is the inevitability, if that's a word, of 
hostility towards aggressive Christian teaching and towards aggressive when you're a Christian who is aggressively moving within the will of God you can expect some pushback okay persecution comes to those who move in the will of God and Satan did Satan try to hinder Paul's ministry all the time all the time uh, Paul says he writes Satan hindered us on another occasion, he talks about Satan. He had a messenger of Satan in his flesh. Remember that? Okay. And the enemy was always after him. So it goes as a okay as a general rule. Okay. With very few exceptions, if you look at the Word of God, that one who moves in the will of God meets resistance as they attempt to do God's will in a world that is that is pushing against God all the time. Does that make sense? That make sense to you? Okay. All right. So then the next element. The seventh word that identifies uh, someone in the service, in, the, uh, in God's will, as they perform service for God, it's the word, we'll call it purpose. In your outlines, you can put the word purpose. One who serves in the will of God is also marked uh, by a very clear purpose in your life. What's your purpose today? With your purpose. In verse 30, Paul writes, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers uh, to God for me. Let's stop right there. Let's look at that. It's a marvelous, marvelous expression there. In the sum of Paul's ministry, the purpose of Paul's ministry is really summed up in that, that statement. He begins, I beg, or some versions will say, plead with you to pray for me that I might carry out my ministry. Why? Why? For his sake? No. For the sake of his safety? No. For the sake of evangelism? Yeah. Not really, though. He says, I beg you through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit. That's the purpose. You see, the thing that motivated Paul to do what, motiv what Paul was doing was not his own comfort. It wasn't his own success. As, as, even as uh, Paul was very successful in the spiritual dimension, the thing that mo moved and motivated Paul, the heart of the Apostle Paul, was the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord. All right? And his great love for the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ's sake was always the, the, the focal point of Paul's ministry. Why do we preach? Why do we preach? Why do we teach? Why do we pray? Why do we give? Why do we serve? Why do we lead? Why do we follow? Why do we do anything? Why do we comfort people and build them up or strengthen them? Why do we discipline when discipline is called for? Why do we do any of that? Well, it's for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not for our sake. Because the goal of the ministry is always for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul said, I'm free from all men, but I've become a servant. I'm free from all men, but I've become a servant. And then he goes on to talk about how to the Jews, he's a Jew. And to those who are without the law, he is without the law. And he says this, then, I have made all things to all men that I might do, by all means, save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. I do it for the sake, when he says the gospel, for the sake of the good news that, I, that speaks to the very glory of God. Always the right motive. Always the right motive. Second Corinthians 4 or 5, he says, We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord. And then listen to this. For ourselves, your, your servants for Jesus. For ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake. For Jesus' sake. And he follows it up in verse 11. He says, We bear in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest 
he did it, what he did, and oftentimes Paul, Paul was in dire straits a lot, but he did what he did for the sake of Christ, that Christ might be manifest in his life. 2 Corinthians 12.10 I take pleasure in my infirmities, okay? Reproaches, necessities, persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. It's a recurring thing. Always the purpose, always the purpose. And the bottom line is very simple. <coughs> Very, the bottom line is really very simple, church. Is your service or my service? What is our motive? What's your motive? When you serve in the church, what's your motive? Is it self glory? Is it to build up a, a measure of self esteem? Is our motive to be thought of uh, well by other people? Is our motive to do the best we can with the life we've got? And I'm not saying necessarily some of a, a flavor of all those might be all right. But the proper motive and goal is to do what we do for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. That has to be first. That has to be first. And see, Paul knew that if he went to Jerusalem with the offering that he had been collecting as he went to the churches in Asia Minor. And, and if he went to Jerusalem with the money, and he was taking some Gentiles with him so they could express their love for the, the Jews in the church in Jerusalem. And when he got there with the money and with the Gentiles, if, if that trip was successful, Christ would be glorified for the sake of Christ. Why? Well, for one thing, Christ wanted the church to be unified. He wanted Jew and Gentile to be able to come together as one in the Church of Christ. You know, there was still a lot of, lot, a lot of distance between the Jews and the Gentiles in their early church. So, but if they became one, who would be glorified? Christ. And if Paul could, could pull that off, he knew by the Spirit that it would be for God's uh, glory. And another thing, God desires a church that's able to demonstrate love to each other. And by that demonstration of love to each other, it demonstrates love to the world, to everybody around. We're supposed to love each other, not necessarily because we like each other. Did you know that? We're supposed to love each other, not necessarily because we like each other. Did you know that? But the world has perverted that word love, and a lot of people don't even understand. We are to love each other, not necessarily because we like each other, but for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, because when the, you know, if you think everybody's supposed to love each other, then what you need to do is go join the Kiwanis. <laughs> Did you know that? They get along. They love each other. In the definition that the world uses for love, they love each other. See, this is a total unique entity. This is totally unique, and it, it, part of its uniqueness is, is that we have the ability to love each other in the spiritual sense in which it is meant in the Word of God, and because of that love for each other, we are able to function in God's will. Okay? You know, we're able to... The world, the world has all of these different things that are relational in nature to fill the hole that God has for you that is really relational in nature. A, a relation with Jesus Christ. And the world has a lot of alternatives for you. There are clubs, there are this, there, there are activities, uh, there, there are uh, fetishes that we have on our own. But with the Lord Jesus Christ, when you have a proper relationship you can get along with anybody. Did you know that? Yeah. You can get along. I've known many people in my, in my Christian life that I didn't like that much. But I did love them. Amen. In the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Is that, I don't know. Some of you are shaking your head. 
Yes, and then others of you have a look of bewilderment on, bewilderment on your face. But that's what the Word teaches. I'm sorry, but that's what the Word teaches. And if you, if you have questions, you can ask me about it any time. But Christ, Christ, Christ would be glorified in the ministry of Paul if, if, if the people in the church displayed a love each other that was divine in nature. See, the love that we express for, for one another, unless it has divinity in it, is in no way, shape, or form divine. So Paul was always seeking for the sake of Christ to glorify Christ. And he said, whatever, remember, remember what Paul said, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, he said, do it all to the glory of God. When you eat, do it to the glory of God. When you drink, do it to the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. That was Paul's supreme, surpassing motive in his life. When Paul wrote to the church in Galatians 6.17, he said, Let no man trouble me. Let no man trouble me. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, it was Paul's pleasure to suffer persecution. It was his pleasure to suffer persecution because in that persecution he brought God more glory. Persecution is not a big deal. Okay. The second thing it says in that 30th of verse about Paul's uh, purpose. His first purpose was for, for Jesus Christ's sake, for his glory. The second purpose, and it's a very unusual phrase, it's only used this one time in the New Testament. Uh, it says, and through the love of the Spirit. And I believe the best way to, to translate that, to understand that would be uh, the love of the Spirit. He, he's, he's doing what he's doing to glorify God, and he's doing it because he loves the Spirit, if you want to write that in. And he says, I do what I do for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and because of my love of the Holy Spirit. If you were to look at the 143rd Psalm in the 10th verse, it's, it's kind of a, the same type of expression there about this loving attitude of the Spirit of God. This is what the psalmist said. He said, teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Let thy good spirit lead me for the sake of thy name, O Lord. Let thy good spirit lead me for the sake of thy name, O Lord. Almost the same sentiment there. For the sake of thy name, O Lord, for the sake of thy good spirit, let me function in your will. And so it's Paul's love for the Lord Jesus Christ and it's love for the Holy Spirit that works in him, that compels him in this life of ministry. So we need to ask ourselves today, much as we did earlier, what compels us? What's your motive for being in church this morning? Are we compelled to serve because of what Christ has done for us? Are you? Because of what the Spirit of God is doing in you today? Because of Christ's gracious and magnanimous and eternal goodness to you? And because of the ongoing grace of the Spirit of God that is given you and is, resides within you? You know, we should be serving in the will of God to bring honor to God and to show our love for His Spirit. The Spirit is the one that's going to give you the push to do what you ought to do, correct? It's going to guide, it's going to lead, as long as we allow ourselves to be guided. The problem is sometimes we get that card in front of the horse. But the Spirit is the one that's going to empower you to do what God wants you to do. So Paul's purpose in his ministry is very, very clear. And anyone in the will of God, I believe, has a set purpose. I have one purpose. To declare the truth of the word of Jesus Christ. To declare the gospel in this church without fail, no matter what, to the best of my ability. Somebody said something to me this morning. I have a habit of kind of speaking down to myself. And they, they said, well, you're, you've been gifted, haven't you? And I, I guess I've been gifted. I've been gifted at a few things. My golf game isn't one of them, but I've been, I've been gifted at a few things. But Paul's purpose is very clear, and I feel very purposeful in my ministry. 
anyone who functions in the will of God has a set purpose to demonstrate honor and glory to Christ and love to the Spirit of God. Okay? So, Paul has a deep spirituality uh, that reigns in his heart, that has control of him. And, you know, oftentimes, nowadays, Christian service, uh, when we use those words, they're oftentimes very shallow, but they weren't shallow with Paul. So we've looked, we've, we've looked at these elements of uh, ministry in God's will. Precision, providence, planning, priority, uh, prosperity, persecution, and purpose. And that kind of sums up uh, service in the will of God. But there's one more key word I want to, I want to close with today. And that's, uh, that one word kind of touches all these other things that we've already said. And that's the eighth element of serving in the will of God. And that's the element of prayer. Prayer. Okay? And we find it in verse 30 at the end of the verse. And then down in verse 32, there is a prayer. There's a, uh, a benediction. And the end of the chapter actually is a benediction. So, in verse 30, notice first of all, he says, I beg, some, some versions will say, I beseech you, brother, through the Lord Jesus Christ, Right, as we've already discussed, and through the love of the Spirit, then this word on prayer. He says that you strive. Anybody have a different word? Join. Mm. Okay. Struggle. That's not bad. That you strive. That word is uh, agonizumai. It's the word, it's the Greek word where we get the word agony, agonizomai. It's a, in, in the way it's written, it's written sun agonizomai, sun agonizomai. And what it, what it means is to agonize. Paul says, I want you to agonize to pray with me. And when he uses the word, any time you, in the Greek, when you see the prefix sun, as you win, it means to take in this in, in this instance the word agony and to intensify it a hundred times over. That's a little bit different than strive. Okay, very very strong world. What Paul's doing, he's saying, help me. That's what he's saying. He's saying, help me in my ministry. Can I say the same thing? Help me. I need your prayer. You know, prayer for me is really an issue of combat. I don't know if you think of it that way. But a ministry that is founded and grounded in the will of God is dependent on prayer. That word, uh, agonizomai, comes from, it's an athletic word. It comes from, in honor of the Olympics, from gymnastics. You know, the Greeks were the first gymnasts, per se. And it's taken from the idea, the agony of, of attempting to perform a perfect routine. It's actually, in other places in the Bible, it's translated the same, agonizomai, translated fight. Come on and fight with me in prayer. Uh, in John 18, 36, Jesus said, my servants would fight agonizomai if my kingdom was of this world. It's a very, of this world. It's a very, very intense word. Prayer. And I believe prayer is a battle because I believe that's biblical. And I've said this before and I'll say it again in passages like this. Prayer is intense. I think sometimes we don't think of it that way. We don't understand that because the battle that we have isn't a battle against flesh. Is it? It's not a battle against flesh. It's a spiritual battle. And I hope over the years here at New Life we've learned that it's a spiritual battle, but 
Prayer is a war, a war waged against who? The forces of evil. The forces of evil that run in the spiritual world. Many of you, uh, some of you may not have heard this. The spiritual world is more real than this world, is it not? The spiritual world is what? It's eternal. What's this world? This is all, yeah, it's a shadow. Amen. This is, this is all temporal in nature. So war, prayer is a war that's waged against the forces of evil, and it's not an easy thing. It's a conflict. And he says, I want you to know that I have a great conflict that I need you to, I will need some mind, I need you to come with me and help me in this battle. I'm engaged in a prayer battle over my, and, you, and I believe their, spiritual situation. In Colossians 4.12, uh, there's a guy called Epiphras. And Epiphras is a wonderful man of prayer. And he was said to always be laboring fervently in prayer that we, that you, I, others then, now, when we pray properly, that we may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. Perfect and complete in the will of God. And the only way you do that is you approach prayer as a battle, an agonizing experience. And there is a, there is a paradox, you know. Uh, we're we're, we're going to teach fervent prayer, but we're also going to preach the sovereignty of God, right? That God is sovereign over all things. But the Word tells us that we're supposed to pray fervent, fervently, does it not? Yes, it does. So we go back to Luke 11. There's a story in Luke 11, you can look at it, when Jesus speaks, and he speaks about a man who, he did this. He came and knocked on the door. And what happened? No one answered. So you know what he did? You know what happened? Nobody answered. You know why he kept knocking? You know what that's all about? The story is to teach you to persevere. The man kept knocking, and because he gave, he put forth a lot of effort, in the end, he reaches what he wanted to reach. James in 5.16, you should read that story. James in 5.16 speaks about the effectual, which means it has effect, fervent prayer of a righteous man, avails much. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effectual avails much. You could put those two together. Fervent prayer of a righteous man. There's, let's see, there's a great spiritual warfare that demands our prayers. And I believe, do you believe that the, the, demons, the demons pursue Paul? That they were on his case all the time? I do. You know, look at his life. Shipwrecked, uh, stoned, left for dead, uh, hit with sticks, uh, repeatedly put upon. So he's asking for prayer because for him, prayer is the way to combat those things that are of the world. He sought prayer from many, and he prayed for many. And he says... Maybe, uh, another illustration, so Ephesians 6, Paul sums it up. He says in 6.18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints for me. I'm praying for this for the saints, and I'm asking the saints to pray the same for me. He's get, you know, in Ephesians 6, what does, what's Ephesians 6 known for? Put on the armor of God, right? And why do you need to put on the armor of God? Because you battle against who? Principalities, powers, and the demons of this world. All right? So you need that. And then he goes on and he says, pray. So the way Paul thinks you do that is that you pray. That's how you pray. A Christian's life that isn't, listen, study is important. I would never degrade the importance of study. But prayer is an essential ingredient to the life of an effective Christian. It's got to be. If you treat your prayer life as, as, a, as a, something that you just pass by, 
you're missing the boat. Back in Colossians 4, 2, Paul writes, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with us, giving thanksgiving, meanwhile praying for us also that God would open to us a door for the world. When he, for the word. And when he wrote that, Paul was in chains and spent me. So he says, pray for me. The battle is great and I need your prayers. All right? Okay? The characteristics, the elements of a life that is being lived in the will of God as it functions in God's ministry. That's what we've been looking at. So next week we will look at three specific things that Paul asked for prayer for, okay? Three things he had in mind as he was asking for this prayer. What are we going to, so what do you think we're going to do now? We're going to pray. We need to pray, right? We're going to pray. So uh, stand with me. Heavenly Father, we... Uh, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the expression of your word, how you've uh, given us a road map by which to follow our lives, how, Father, you uh, call us to uh, open that map, not only to open it, how you also ask us to, to follow it, how you ask us, Lord, to, to understand it, to heed it, to... Uh, Meditate on it. Lord, we thank you for that opportunity. Lord, you're, you're not a God who just says, I am God, and doesn't teach his people who he is. You're a God who lets us know how you are. It would be my prayer, Lord, that uh, as you lead us in this work, that you would uh, engineer within us a greater understanding, that you would help us to, to see what you want each and every one of us to see as individuals. Is our service of the proper motive? Are we compelled to serve for the proper reason? Have we, have we, have we been servicing you? Or have we been servicing ourselves? Lord, it's up to each and every heart to answer those questions. But Father, we call upon your spirit to help us answer those questions. And Father, as we call upon your spirit, we pray that if there's anyone here today, Lord, that doesn't know you, that this would be a day they would come to saving grace. Even here today, Lord, in a room with this many people, I think your word would show us that there are those here that don't know you. That the way that they, the way to eternity is a a narrow way. And the gate is very, very small and many won't even be able to find the gate. So Lord, we, we call out to your spirit. We pray, Lord, that hearts will be convicted by your word. Not by me, but by your word. And Lord, whatever the need might be today, if it's a need for counsel, if it's a need for church membership, scriptural baptism, Whatever the need might be, Father, if, it's, if there's someone who wants to voice a praise for what you've done in their life, Lord, we're going to give this time to you. We're, we're so thankful, Lord. We're, we're thank you for what you've seen done with a, with a fledgling, a one program. We're thank you. I'm thankful how you've uh, already begun to work through that. I thank you, Lord, for a grandson who, at two years old, has learned his first scripture. And I don't... Uh, you are so, so good. And Father, the world just doesn't get to see those things, just how good you are. So I pray, Lord, that we would function in your will. I pray, Lord, that we would look totally different from the world. I pray, Lord, that in that difference, we would, we would draw people to you, and that, they would, that we would then have the opportunity to declare the good news. Father, uh, be with your people. Be with your people everywhere today, Father. Lift up all churches to you who 
Lord, that proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we give this time to you. May you find us to be faithful and true, as you always are, faithful and true. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.